Hey, welcome everyone again. Another valuation session, another lovely summer weekend. Um, happy Saturday to everyone. I think uh, very, very interesting week in the markets. Yet again, maybe even more interesting than we thought the market could get. So uh, extreme volatility both ways. Uh, lots going on in the physical market, the paper markets. I see lots of oil spaces happening with uh, upwards of five, seven, 800 people on there. So obviously it's, it's on the top of mind, even if not as an investment thesis, but just people are interested to know kind of what's going on with oil, gasoline, diesel, natural gas, et cetera. It's been in the media cycle here, here for a little bit as well now, and lots of political uh, interference, if you will. And lots happening as we, as we kind of go into the summer, with um, some sort of record record demand expected in various sectors. And maybe I'll leave that for the more macro side, but um, today we're gonna to be talking about New Vista, Obsidian, and Aventive. For people who have attended these sessions before, it's gonna be the exact same, pretty much the exact same setup. You will notice I have moved the template, the, the valuation template from Excel to Google Sheets. It's just easier to, have some of the boxes update in real time when I link it to Google, whereas Excel doesn't quite have the same features. Maybe maybe the online Excel does, but I've moved everything anyway. So if you're looking for this valuation template now, um, and whether you have or have not attended these, it's on whitetundra.ca. If you scroll to the bottom under files, um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a little link there. You will have to have a Google account and you can make a copy, which will copy the template and then the, the data table sheet, which auto updates the exchange rate and some of the commodity pricing in real time. So everything in update in your sheets in real time, you know, the exchange rate goes here and whatnot. And before I start, anyone on the Twitter spaces that would like to join for the visuals part of this, uh, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events, there's a Zoom link and you can hop on. If not, feel free to listen in on the Twitter spaces. Both are recorded, the spaces and the Zoom, and they will be posted on the YouTube channel and the website in, in a couple of hours here after the session ends. And I can only take questions on Zoom, unfortunately, just the way the audio recording works. So if you would like to participate, uh, please join the Zoom. And other than that, uh, welcome again. I am. I just want to say a couple of things up front. I'm not an investment advisor. The evaluation methodology I share today is my own opinion. It's one that I've built um, kind of myself using other people's work um, as a proxy and then adjusting it to my, my experience and my, what I think is important. So please do your own due diligence. Please check your own risk tolerance, your portfolio construction. I cannot stress this enough after what's happened in the last two weeks. Um, please do your own due diligence. Check, make sure you know these companies, you understand the macro, you're understanding the investment thesis here and you're not gonna get um, kicked out of the trade based on short-term volatility, which I think there's gonna be more and more expected here as we go. There's less people in the market. There's less money in the market. The open interest on Brent and WTI has gone down quite a bit. So a few amounts of contracts can change the prices big time. And that's just the, the reality we live in. So um, that's that. And I do have a mailing list. So I send out these files that I'll be talking about today, the, the New Vista files, Obsidian files. So if you're interested in going on the mailing list, please message me, DM me, or email me. I am running quite a bit behind on email. So I uh, apologize if I didn't get you in on the list yet, but working on that and going to catch up here as we go. And yeah, like I said before I started the recording is going to try and keep these quicker and quicker now. I'm noticing that as the summer kind of goes on, people have other travel plans and, and stuff to do that some of the viewership drops off if I, if I keep it going too long. So keep it concise, keep it quick. And for anyone that's joining us for the first time, you maybe feel rushed through it. I've covered 
almost 50 companies now, I want to say somewhere between 40 to 50 companies have, have been covered. And the previous sessions are all recorded and we'll give you a better idea of, of things in detail. But for the sake of these valuation sessions, I think they're getting pretty co common now. People who attend these sessions are getting comfortable with, with my valuation metrics and methodology. So I'm gonna just run through them and then talk more about some of the other insights that, that I wanna talk about, stuff from the corporate presentation of these companies. Why am I looking at them? What makes them a little bit different? And how can they be, um, how can they be interesting to a certain type of investor? Because we have all kinds of investors in the oil and gas space, uh, short-term, long-term, medium term, the risk profiles are, are very different across the investment base. So yeah, so we'll get started. Again, for anyone that wants to follow along this template, it's also on the website, whitetundra.ca under files. You can open it up, make your copy and follow along. If not, just listen in and um, yeah, we'll get started here. So basically when we look at companies, um, I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible these valuation models, these accounting models can get very, very complex. So try and simplify it. If you're working in the finance industry, you may find some inaccuracies to the tune of one, two, 3%. And the spreadsheet is designed that way. It's not supposed to be 100% accurate. We want to run through 20, 30, 40, 100, 200 companies in short time, find the ones that screen well, and then do a deeper dive on those. So we don't want to spend too much time on trying to look at things that only change the, the end value by one, two, three percent. So anyway, we'll get started. So the first thing you need, name of the company, New Vista. Um, on this session, I've kind of changed things up. I've pre-filled the boxes instead of filling them as we go. Again, just for the sake of time, if you're interested as to why I'm putting certain things in, the reasoning behind it, please check out the previous sessions to get caught up to speed. And I think this is the way I'll, I'm kind of going to do them as I go, because I want to keep these short. I want to keep these under hour and a half, two hours to do the three companies and then have a little Q&A period and, and kind of go from there. But we have New Vista. We need the production number and the liquids percentage. We need to know what's the company making. And we always want the latest quarter of data. So. We're almost at the end of Q2 here, but we only have Q1 results. So that's what we're gonna use. So if we open the MDNA, which is the management's discussion and analysis file, usually these files give you everything you need. So between this, the corporate presentation and the financial statements, you really have everything you need. We don't need to go deep into other documents. So here's the number we're looking for, 66599. BOEs per day was their production for Q1. Three months ended March 31st. That's the number I'm going to put in there. Liquids percentage, they actually give us the liquids percentage, which is nice. Uh, condensate and NGL weighting, 43%. So we take that number, put it in there. And we also want to divide up what kind of oil it is because condensate trades at a different price than heavy oil, than light oil than NGLs. So we wanna make sure we have our breakdown proper as to what the company is doing. And thankfully a lot of companies have actually gone to a very standardized table like this. And as I go on, as I talk to management teams that don't have this or investor relations personnel, I say, look, this is what we need. We need it clearly laid out. You can't be confusing investors who are coming in and they don't understand your, your metrics. They don't understand where to find information. So I'm hoping more and more kind of go to this, this clear displayed format. And basically we just, again, copy, paste the numbers in. So 21680 is the condensate. This is our NGLs. And then the natural gas number self-calculates just based on the, the BOE's number that we put in. And that's your production. The next thing we need is what's the company worth right now? If we're gonna be comparing share prices and valuations, we need to know what's the company worth. So box 11, number of shares outstanding. And again, right here, 
we have share trading statistics, common shares outstanding, 228 million. For anyone new to doing these spreadsheets, uh, please make sure you put the numbers in, in the right units. If you don't put that in, it's gonna screw up the entire calculation. So make sure you're putting the right units in. And once you do one, two, three, four of them, it gets pretty straightforward as to, as to what this methodology is trying to show. The next thing we have is the share price. So again, one of the benefits of moving to Google Sheets is it self-calculates. So all you gotta do is change the ticker up here. So you see, I have it set up to New Vista and you just change it to, to whatever ticker you want or you're, you're going through. It'll self-calculate the current, um, the current share price. And in fact, the shares outstanding box can also be automated. So if you wanna use the code and you just wanna keep using what, what Google has, it'll make things a lot easier. If you're running through again, 30, 40, 50 companies, you don't wanna be manually putting in numbers all the time. You can use the Google Finance API. It's actually really, really solid and updates in real time. <clears throat> So we have the shares outstanding and the share price. You multiply them by each other, you get the market cap. Share price multiplied by shares, you get the market cap. The market cap tells you what is the total value of all the company's shares. That's it, simple as that. To that, we add our net debt. And if we go back here, right there, in the first part of the table, net debt, $413 million. We stick that in there, in the box, and we get our enterprise value. Enterprise value is equal to your market cap plus your net debt. So simple, you add them up, you get your EV. EV is the total value of the company. If somebody was gonna ask you, what is New Vista Energy worth today? It's worth the enterprise value, $2.634 billion. And the next thing the spreadsheet calculates is the debt to EV ratio. This basically just tells you of the enterprise value of the company, how much is debt? What does it mean? If you are a very aggressive, high risk, high torque investor, you may want companies that have more debt to EV because your, your equity value is almost leveraged in a way, you have financial leverage on that equity. When commodity prices are rising, you would think a lot of investors want the higher debt companies, a higher debt to EV, gives you that leveraged exposure on the upside. On the other side, if the commodity price are going down or you're more of a risk, risk um, less risk investor, risk averse investor, you go with a lower debt to EV ratio. And it just sounds strange saying risk averse and oil because they don't, they don't really match. But within the oil industry, there, there's less risky plays, you know, more, more equity plays and more debt debt heavy plays, um, so I'll leave it at that. And the next thing we need is the annual dividend. New Vista, as far as I know, doesn't pay a dividend right now, so uh, zero, you know, this is self-calculated box. And the next thing we need is the adjusted funds flow. Adjusted funds flow tells you, what did the company make? How much money did the company make after all their expenses? So tax, interest, operating cost, transportation, the salaries for the people in the office, the uh, coffee pods for the coffee machine in, in the downtown Calgary office, everything. When you take all the costs out, except capital cost, you get adjusted funds flow. From adjusted funds flow, we subtract capital cost to get free cash flow. So free cash flow is equal to adjusted funds flow minus capital. Why do we look at it like this? Because oil and gas wells are not flat production. When you have a well producing oil, it declines. So if it's producing X amount of barrels today, in six months, it's gonna produce something lower than that in most cases. So we need to spend money to keep production flat. And that's why we need to subtract capital to get the free cash flow, which tells us how much money did the company make not only after all their expenses, but after keeping their production flat, or if there's a growth wedge in there, you include that 
um, in the capital. And then we account for the growth later on in the same spreadsheet. Um, so yeah, so we wanna take into account all the capital cost, including growth. And then we reconcile that later on here. So uh, the number will be right here. We have our adjusted funds flow, $190 million, easy. And then we have our capital expenditures is 120. So we get 190 is the adjusted funds flow, subtract capital of 120, we get $70 million of free cash flow. So 190, and this should be 70, but it's 99, why? So this is a recent adjustment I made because I began noticing that previously, it really used to be just the gas companies. We had to be worried about this phenomena, but now it's almost every company is doing this where their capital expenditures are not consistent quarter to quarter. So what do I mean by that is if there's a company that spends a lot of capital upfront in, in the first quarter, which is especially important in Canada because a lot of drilling happens in Q1 in the winter season, when we have the frost in the ground, the ground is solid. There's, there's an excessive amount of capital being spent in Q1 versus the other quarters. And where am I going with that? If we take the actual capital number in Q1 and we try and calculate our free cash flow, we're gonna get a lower than normal free cash flow, right? Because the capital cost is ratio wise, it's more in Q1 than the rest of the quarters. If we take that as a number, we're gonna have a lower than expected free cash flow value because we spent too much money off our budget in Q1. So how do we reconcile that? We go to the corporate presentation, uh, open that here, and we look at the 2022 capital expenditures. We take the midpoint, $365 million. That's roughly $90, $90 million a quarter. And we instead use that as our capital number. So don't go off what the company actually spent. We go off the budget divided by four. So again, 365, take the midpoint, divide that by four, about $91 million. So I'm gonna subtract $91 million as my capital expenditure. Now, this spreadsheet is fully flexible. Some of you here might be thinking, well, what if they actually had to spend extra money in Q1 because of inflation, because of supply chain issues, they had to pay extra for casing. That's why the spreadsheet is fully flexible. If you think we should add in a 10% inflation to this, you can do that. We can, instead of taking 365 million, we can add 10% inflation, we can take 400 million. Divide that by four again, 100 million, subtract that from adjusted funds flow, you get your free cash flow, you can put 90 million here. Fully flexible. Um, and that's the way the spreadsheet is built. If you have a specific insight on the industry, you know something, you wanna put in your own sauce on it, your own adjustments, feel free to do that. All the yellow boxes, you can put in whatever you want, adjust it to your own interpretation. But I'm gonna use Nuvis's budget, 365 divided by 491 is my capital for, for one Q. And subtract that from adjusted funds flow, I get free cash flow of about $99 million last quarter. The next thing now we need to do is take out the impact of hedging. And why is that? Because we wanna know what is the company making on a strictly operational basis without the impacts of financial contracts and take or pay contracts, you know, other financial metrics that skew what is the company actually making? How profitable is it? So how do we find this number? Again, we go back to the MDNA. And the number that I usually look for is the realized loss on financial derivatives. It's also known as risk management contracts, hedging contracts, uh, commodity price management. There's all sorts of names for it. But basically, they lost $7.54 a BOE in the quarter 
on hedging. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to calculate the hedging loss myself. So you take $7.54 a BOE, multiply that by the number of BOEs they made per day and the number of days in the quarter. So Q1 has 90 days, 31 in January and March, 28 in February, 90 days. And we self-calculate this hedging loss um, divided by a million, um, you don't have to put it in million dollars. And we also got to put it in negatives because it's a hedging loss. So it goes in as a negative. If you look through the actual MDNA, they will tell you this number that they lost $45 million. But I also want to show you how to calculate it yourself in case they don't give it to you or you just want to know where the number comes from. So again, $7.54 a BOE lost multiplied by the BOEs per day, multiplied by the number of days in that quarter, you get your total dollar amount loss per quarter um, when the units get canceled out. So $45 million was lost. Why do we take hedging out? Because hedging is not consistent. Hedging changes quarter to quarter. Hedging changes depending on what commodity price is going on. And we just wanna take the impact of it out. We're gonna put the actual impact back in later on because we wanna take the impact of Q1 out and we wanna put the impact of the actual hedges for the next year back in as the spreadsheet goes along. The next thing we need to know is, okay, the company made this much money, but at what price, right? Commodity prices change. Some of us are expecting higher oil pricing. Some of us are expecting lower oil pricing, flat oil pricing, whatever you're expecting. We need to know the company made this much money at what price, and then we adjust it to the current price. So go back to the MDNA file. We look for benchmark pricing right there. We have our WTI, we have our ACO pricing, uh, and we have our exchange rate, we have all this condensate, that's the exact number I put in here. Last quarter's pricing WTI in US dollars, 94.29, right here, 94.29, exactly what it says, put it in. Same with WCS, NGLs, and ACO, 474, right there, 474. It was the benchmark price, put that in there. And again, the nice thing about Google Sheets is I've, I've automated all the strip pricing. So what do we mean when we talk about strip pricing? Strip pricing tells you if you were to sell a barrel of oil, one barrel for every month for the next 12 months, what price would, would you get? About $97.62 is, is what Google is telling us. If you wanna know where to get this yourself, you go to RBC, richardsonbar.com and you have our 12 month strip pricing for a WTI as well here. There's many ways to get strip pricing. All we're trying to figure out is how much money did the company make at what pricing last quarter? And then we wanna adjust it to what is the actual pricing going forward. So last quarter's pricing, strip pricing, the rest auto fills itself, the gas price as well fills itself um, from, the, from the ACO strip pricing, which is our Canadian natural gas terminal. And that's it, we're done. Um, before I explain this next part here, I will say, if you just joined us for the first time, you thought this was too rushed, please have a look at the previous sessions. I go through things in much more detail, where I found the numbers, what they mean, uh, way more. It just doesn't make sense for me to keep saying that every week on every session because people will you know, start tuning out when it's the same information over and over. But we're done, that's it. And one more point before I get to this box is if you feel that WTI is gonna average 120 next year, again, the spreadsheet is fully flexible. You can put 120 in there. If you think gas is gonna be seven bucks, you put seven in there and the spreadsheet will update 
to fit your model, your interpretation and your opinion um, as, as to what's going on. So this is all calculated by the spreadsheet. And what is it telling us? We, we've taken last quarter's free cash flow and we annualize it. So the first thing we got to do, we, we look at the first quarter, free cash flow, and we analyze it for the whole year. That's basically what this first row is telling us. The second row is free cash flow yield. What the free cash flow yield is telling us is how much percentage free cash flow is the company making compared to their enterprise value. So at strip pricing, the model tells us New Vista is going to make $648 million of free cash flow after all expenses, after all capital. And it's basically dividing it by the enterprise value, which we discussed earlier, 2634. And we get about a 25% free cash flow yield. What does that mean? That means that at strip pricing, which is $97 WTI and $5 ACO gas, after all expenses, all capital, everything, New Vista today could pay a 25% dividend. Or they can pay a 12% dividend and do a 10% share buyback and pay off a little bit of debt. Or you can do a 25% share buyback, right? It, all it's telling you is how much money does the company make that they can give back to you as a percentage. So, okay, 25%. My model and my thinking is if there's companies on the market trading at 25% dividends, you know, let's say New Vista decides to give all the money back in dividends. If there was a company trading in the Canadian oil and gas market at 25% yield, what would the market do? Okay, hypothetical, just think about it. What would the market do? My opinion is that the market will bring it back as in it will increase the share price to bring the company back to about a 12.5% yield. 12.5% dividend yield, I think is good. It's not too low, it's not too high, and it accounts properly for the risk. The, the risk that's in these companies, you're taking the commodity price risk, the price takers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They don't control the commodity, despite what a lot of people think. So, about a 12.5% yield, I think is pretty fair, is what I would want to invest in these companies. I want them to generate at least 12.5% yield. Okay, how do we bring that back to a fair share price? Basically what I'm saying is, if the company generates 12.5% yield for eight years, right? 12.5% times eight equals 100%. If they generate a 12.5% yield for eight years, I get my total value of the company. You know, the, it adds up to the enterprise value of the company. It adds up to 100% of the company. Eight years, so we pick an eight multiple. We, we, we come back to an eight multiple. That's why this is known as the eight times free cash flow model. If you think that the companies will, will keep trading at a 25% yield, the market is not gonna bring it back to a 12.5% yield, all you gotta do is calculate how many years does it take at that percentage to get to 100% and you use that model. You use a free cash flow times four, which would be a 25% yield per year. You can use free cash flow times six, which would be a 16.6% yield per year, right? 16.6 .6 times six, 100%, you use a six model. So. The spreadsheet is not quite that user-friendly yet, but I'm gonna put in a box here that says, what multiple do you wanna use? And it will self-calculate all the numbers based on the multiple you wanna use. I always use eight because I think in a long-term, higher for longer commodity price environment, the companies will get to free cash flow times eight, especially as they start paying back debt and they go more into dividends, share buybacks, cash return uh, to shareholders policies. Um, so again, very flexible, use whatever number you would like to use. 
Um, I use the eight free cash flow times eight model. So what we do, we just take this number here, we multiply it by eight, we get our enterprise value of the company, you subtract debt from that, and you get the, the market cap, the fair market cap, divide that by the number of shares, you get the fair share price. Simple as that. So for those on Twitter, uh, New Vista Energy at strip pricing, the fair share price, using a free cash flow times eight model is $20.87 at $100 oil, it's $21.64. At $120 oil, it's, it's $29.65. So people on, on Twitter wanted to know these numbers out loud uh, because obviously you can't see the screen. <laughs> So uh, that's that. The other point I'll make is that when people say X company is trading at a $70 WTI valuation, <clears throat> this is what they mean. At $70 WTI, the model puts New Vista's fair share price at $9.61, which is roughly where it's trading today. So therefore the market on a free cash flow times eight model is trading New Vista as if oil was $70. Now, I get a lot of pushback, especially recently that, well, hang on a sec. These companies are not trading at free cash flow times eight. So how can you be using a free cash flow times eight model? Well, the reality is, I think they're gonna go to a free cash flow times eight model. And I think that's where the opportunity lies. If everything was already trading at fair, fair share price values, why would I even invest in the sector, right? It's an it's a overvalued or fairly valued sector. My thinking is, as the commodity prices stabilize, as they stay higher for longer, as people agree more with the oil macro bullish thesis, as people are looking for places to invest, they, they will be the ones that will re-rate these prices back to free cash flow times eight. So I get a lot of messages saying, your model is busted, your model is, is dumb, it's stupid. We're never gonna get to free cash flow times eight. How can you say that right now at the beginning of the cycle? It's, it's, it's just so strange to me, but I think it's, I need to also explain why I use the model and why I continue to use the model. So the reasoning is within six months, 12 months, 18 months, whatever number you wanna use, I believe the, the, the companies will re-rate to that. And this is my reasoning right here. If the companies are, are mostly debt-free, right? And they're generating 27, 25% free cash flow per year yield. And they decide to give it all back in dividends, right? I don't think any of these oil companies are gonna trade at a 20% dividend yield or a 25% dividend yield for very long. And if you agree with that statement, you're naturally agreeing that these companies will get re-rated from a fair share price standpoint to a lower yield. Now, what that yield is, I don't know. You may think it comes down to 16%. You may think it comes down to 8%. You may think it comes down to 12%, right? That's your own subjective number. And that's the free cash flow multiple you wanna use. But anyone who's against this model, you're basically telling me that you expect these companies in six months or a year to trade at 25% dividend yields on the market and the market's not gonna re-rate them. And if you believe that, all the power to you. Um, I don't believe that's gonna happen. And I also have a, have a very strong view on the macro thesis and what you'll find is a lot of people, I'm kind of digressing here, but I also want to explain my thinking behind the model, given the amount of people that, that want kind of a better explanation, is that all of this depends on the oil macro thesis, right? Even at $80 oil, New Vista's trading at a 17% yield. If they came out with a 17% dividend today, do you think the market's going to leave them there or, or is it going to re-rate them? Um, look at Cardinal Energy as kind of your, your example one, when they came out with a roughly six, was it six to 8% dividend yield, the market even re-rated that back to a five to 6% yield, um, let alone somebody coming out with a 16, 18, 25% dividend. Uh, it's, 
it's going to be interesting. The first company that comes out with it and what they get re-rated to will give us a really good understanding as to where things are going. And it may not be a 25% dividend. It may be a 10% dividend along with a 10% share buyback, along with a 5% acquisitions slash land, land sales. You know, it, they're not all going to put out the entire thing in dividends. Um, so this is the free cash flow times eight model. We also have an adjusted funds flow times four model. So if you don't want to look at free cash flow, you, you just want to look at adjusted funds flow. What is the company making other than capital? Um, you can use adjusted funds flow times four. It's a more conservative model. As you can see, the fair share prices are lower. Um, still at strip pricing, we're, we're about $16 a share for the, the strip pricing uh, fair share price. So a few questions here. Uh, okay. Raymac asks, why have I lost all my gains? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer for you. This, this is the market. This is the oil market. It's volatile. It's up and down. The paper markets are out there. The physical markets are out there. And check your portfolio construction. Check your risk tolerance. If you don't want to lose gains, um, lock in some. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, there's no refund. Sorry, you you play the game on the markets. Uh, not game. You you invest accordingly based on your best educated guess. And unfortunately, there's there's no money back policy, and we invest. I invest for more of a long-term thesis. I think share prices are gonna come back to this and the day-to-day -day volatility does worry me. It affects me, it affects everyone. And it all depends on your investment style. If you're, if you're here to make a quick buck and you're day trading, you're taking a risk that there's gonna be downside and upside. That's how this industry has always been. And the, the question is just, it's just funny the way it's being phrased. Um, okay. Uh, JT asks, do you think the $70 assumption is based on a steeply backward-rated futures curve? Great point. Absolutely great point. So this is one point I really, really want to get across. And thanks to Joe Beats for giving me this idea. I forgot to mention it in one of my other, other seminars, but the backward-rated curve does not mean anything. It does not mean anything. It is not telling you that the price in 2025 is going to be $70. That's, that's not what the backwardation and the futures market tells you. A very, very big misconception that a lot of people have. What a backwardated market is telling you is we want oil now. We want it today. I'm willing to pay you $10, $15, $20 more today than I would in the future. To, to get you to sell that oil to me right now. That's all it means. The supply demand today is more undersupplied than in the future. That's, that's what it's telling you today. And that's it. It's not telling you the price is going to be this, the price is going to be that. Um, we need to get this misconception out of our heads. Like the backwardation does not tell you what the future price is. If you Look at how accurate the backwardations or the futures market is. It is not accurate at all. And I believe it's Jeremy McRae from Raymond James that puts out these GIFs, uh, GIFs and videos of how closely the, the actual price ended up being to the futures price, let's say a year out. And it's just absolutely wrong. It's completely wrong. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is don't look at the futures market as like, this is what the market thinks the price is gonna be in the future. No, all it's telling you is we want the supply today. That's, that's all, all we can gauge from a backward rate curve. Um, okay, so are reserves being taken into account? So net asset values are getting more and more important as we go. I have a net asset value calculator slash template coming up. I did one session on reserves, but I don't think reserves are, are really that important in terms of comparing companies. Why? 
This is a relative valuation tool. I use this to compare all the companies I want to look at. I find the ones that are generating cash flow. If you have huge reserves, but you are not generating cash flow, what's the point, right? Like, why, why would I invest in that company? So, the first thing I want to look at is, is free cash flow. Is the company generating cash flow? Once I've picked my top five, seven, 10 companies, that's when I go and look into reserves. Do the reserves match up? Can this company continue at these production rates? Are they going to have to buy, acquire land, acquire assets? So that's a secondary method. And why is that? Because the net asset value calculations are an absolute valuation tool. It tells you what is this company exactly worth in terms of the net asset value? It's not a relative comparison because you can't compare them properly, um, especially at different commodity pricing. So great question. This template does not take reserves into account, but once I pick my top companies, then yes, I do look at reserves and net asset values. Okay, so there's some other questions here. I'll leave this to the Q&A session. I don't want to derail the, the valuation side, but I will get back to you here, uh, iPhone 2. And uh, yeah, so we have the fair share prices, but remember, we took hedging out of the equation. Now, what do we want to do? We want to put hedging back in, but not Q1 hedging. We want to put the next 12 months of actual hedging back in. We get that in the corporate presentation. So if we scroll to the bottom under the, uh, two, where are we here? So natural gas hedge position and oil hedge position. Um, I don't wanna to get too deep into the hedges, how they work. Please have a look at the previous sessions or Google has really good stuff on explaining hedges. So how many MCFs are hedged and at what price? It tells you exactly that. Same with oil. And basically you put the numbers in. Number of barrels hedged and at what price in Canadian dollars? These are the numbers. If you, if you reconcile this, the green line, which is the ceiling and the floor with the number of barrels, you will get exactly these numbers. So we're putting the hedging impact back in. It tells us how much hedging loss the company will have at different oil pricing slash different gas pricing. Um, so, you know, it just gives you a rough number. And why do I mention this? You will see when I talk about Aventive, because the hedging they're losing at some of the higher pricing is just absolutely crazy, but I'll get to it. Um, so yeah, we'll put the hedging back in. We have our hedging loss, the actual hedging loss going forward, the actual impact of the financial contracts going forward. The next thing we wanna put in is the production growth. If we're spending capital, extra capital, we might have a production growth. So how do we know the number? We go up here, we look at New Vista's full year production for 2022. We take the midpoint, so 67,000 to 69,000 is what they tell us they're gonna produce. We take the midpoint, 68,000, and we compare it to what did they actually make? So Q1, they made 66.5, 66.6. They're saying they're gonna make 68 for the year. So there's about a 14 to 1500 BOE a day growth built in there. And that's exactly what I'm going to put in here. 1400 BOEs of growth at what net back. So we go back to our um, MDNA management discussion and analysis. We look for net back. The operating net back was roughly $35 a BOE in Q1. We need to adjust that for the commodity prices. Natural gas prices are higher. Condensate prices are higher and WTI is higher. So I'm gonna give them about five to $7 benefit that they're gonna gain on the operating net back. So 35 plus seven, you know, 42, 43, 41, et cetera. Um, okay, so we put hedging back in, we put production growth back in. Here's our fair share prices now with everything taken into account. We've taken hedging, production, cash flow. 
the ACO pricing, WTI, everything's been put in. These are the fair share prices at these oil prices and strip gas. And then we also have one that adjusts the gas price going forward. If you have checked out my price target spreadsheet, these are the exact numbers that are getting put in there. And this is the explanation why, as we've just discussed over the last 45 minutes. So for anyone on Twitter, the strip fair, fair share price, 1884 at $100 oil, 550 gas, 2043, $120 oil, $6 gas is 2759. So we have about, at strip pricing, we have about a 95, 100% potential gain to get to that fair share price. So to explain my methodology, I would take this number, I would see how much upside I have to the current share price. I would look at 55, 60 companies that I'm tracking. I would pick the top five, top seven, top 10, top 15, and then do a deeper dive on them. Look at net, net asset value, look at management quality, look at their asset quality. What kind of wells are they making? or uh, drilling, how is inflation affecting them? You know, what kind of acreage do they have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you might have your own things you wanna look at. You might wanna look at, maybe you don't care about reserves, you only care about management, you know, et cetera. So, and that's it, we're done. We, if you wanna continue on and look into 2023, the spreadsheet has a bunch of boxes you can, you can fill in. And you can basically say, look, I'm a long-term investor. I'm gonna invest for three years or five years. I don't care about 2022, it's, it's too short-term. You wanna look into 2023, you can fill these boxes in and you will get a projected 2023 free cash flow strip. Um, and remember, a lot of companies are less hedged in 2023 than they are in 2022. So the number can change sometimes in, in drastic fashion. We also have here the 2022 end net debt number. So this tells us New Vista is projected to be debt-free by the end of this year. And in fact, have $200 million in cash on the books by, by the end of this year. Of course, if they don't pay back dividends or if they don't do anything else. So yeah, that's that. And now I'll discuss some of the other things about New Vista that you know, maybe for those who have been listening to these presentations, I think a lot of people are more interested in, in this part of the, the sessions these days. Um, so look at this, the production growth that New Vista has gone through, they've roughly three x their production from 2017. Why am I talking about this? Because more and more I'm seeing people talk about, well, if X company was at this much share price in 2014, why can't it get back there? Okay, fair point. But there's two critical things missing from that sort of calculation. One is your number of shares outstanding. If the company has two to three times the number of shares outstanding, the share price it's gonna to get to for the same value of company, it's gonna be way lower. So prime example, Baytex. If you look at Baytex's share count in 2016, 2014 versus today, people are saying, oh, well, it can get to this share price. Well, maybe not because they have way more shares outstanding so that the actual share price it can get to is gonna be lower. Um, not saying one way or another, it's a good company to invest in or not. I'm just saying, keep these things in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is production. If a company's production has three times in five years, and you're saying New Vista used to trade at this many dollars a share in 2017, technically it should be able to get to three times that in 2022 because the production is 3X, the cash flow would be three to four X, you know, at, at the same commodity pricing, the free cash flow would be much, much, much higher. So on a free cash flow multiple, the fair share price should be way higher. It's, it's a little naive to be comparing share prices today to share prices you know, three, four, five years ago um, without properly accounting for 
the growth in production and the number of shares. So keep those things in mind when you're discussing certain things uh, with, with other people. Uh, the other thing, New Vista, if you listen to me in October, November, December of last year, I was not a fan of this name because they had take or pay contracts. A take or pay contract means if you can't grow production or provide this production, you have to pay the fees anyway. Okay, so it's like, it's like if you had a monthly parking pass in Calgary downtown, whether you, you go to the office five times a month or, or 29 times a month or 30 times a month, you pay the same fee. That's kind of how a take or pay contract works. So what New Vista had done is signed up for take or pay contracts for more than what they were producing. So they were saying, look, we're gonna grow from 2017 onwards and let's just sign these contracts and we can grow production to meet it. But then COVID happened, inflation happened, supply chain issues happened. I wasn't sure if New Vista would be able to grow to meet their, their own capacity that they signed up for. As we go on, I'm getting more and more confident. And now it's becoming a benefit. Why is it becoming a benefit? Two things. One, they have firm capacity. They know they have the pipeline space. They know they have the processing capacity. Compare this to a company like Pipestone, which recently lowered their 2022 guidance of production because they're suffering from issues. They can't find people to take the gas. They can't find people to take the condensate. They're having issues with reliability on compression, right? If you can't get your production out, you're not making any money. So New Vista's take or pay contracts have gone from a liability to an asset just because commodity prices are higher and because we're now suffering a bottleneck in Montney gas processing capacity. Simple as that. The second thing is when you have a massive facility that handles gas, handles oil, if you're only running it at 30% full, you're still paying the full cost of running this facility. You're paying the power, you're paying the operators, you're paying the land, property tax, you're paying the lease maintenance cost, and you're only running at 30% capacity. As New Vista's production grows and they fill up these facilities, their per BOE operating cost is gonna go down 25%, okay? So, why is that important? Because it allows them to counter inflation. A lot of companies, you'll see their operating costs are gonna go up 10, 15, 20, 30% over the next 12 months. New Vistas might stay flat or actually go down because they're making more efficient use of their facilities. Very, very important. Why? Because let's say we take $3 a barrel, right? $3 of BOE that New Vista has an advantage over their peers. $3 of BOE times 70,000 BOEs for one year, that's roughly $75 million of extra free cash flow that New Vista will generate versus their peers because they have these facilities, okay? What does $75 million get you? It gets you about a 3% dividend bonus for free. You're getting this extra money that, that nobody's really talking about that the market I don't think realizes. You have this pre-built extra bonus cherry on top because these per, per BOE cash costs are gonna be coming down. So with New Vista, it's only $3. I will say, if you look at other companies in the industry, you will find companies that can save up to seven, eight, $10 a BOE going forward multiply that by their production. And um, there's companies that are gonna diverge seriously because some are gonna get hampered by inflation. So their operating costs gonna go up 30%. And there's companies that as they grow, their operating costs per BOE is actually gonna come down significantly. And that could be a difference of 10, 15, $20 a BOE. Run that over 
their production cycle for a whole year, and you will find serious divergence in performance between these companies and free cash flow generation as things go on. Um, I don't want to name specific names, but look at companies that have absolutely sky high operating cost and how they can lower them as they grow production. They might have facilities that are 10% full, 20% full, that as they fill them up, they save a lot of money uh, per BOE. Um, okay, enough on that topic. So the next thing, Pipestone and Wapiti. New Vista has two assets, Pipestone, Wapiti. Pipestone has better wells, but look at the Pipestone acreage here. It's getting pretty filled up. There's, there's not as much runway in this as they have in the Wapiti. Look at the amount of yellow land, the blocks that are open versus the blocks that are open in the Pipestone area. So you may not care. If you're investing for the next six months, you may not care. But if you're investing for the next three, five, seven years, keep these things in mind. Where, where does the company have their reserves? Like both of these are counted as the same in reserve life index, but the Pipestone wells are quite a bit better than the Wapiti wells. Uh, on, on my last check anyway, that's how it was. So when you're looking at reserves and asset quality, look at where they have their actual inventory left. And is that inventory as good as their, as their existing production and as good as the wells they're drilling in 2022? If it's lower quality, you might want to adjust for that going forward. Uh, the other thing, lowering cost. Every company talks about lowering cost. They lower their drilling costs, they lower their completion costs. They somehow manage to get efficiencies year after year after year. And we're seeing things change. Because of inflation, because of supply chain issues, costs have now gone up in 2022. Watch this, track this very closely. Certain companies, if they don't have good rigs, if they don't have good long-term contracts with their service companies, are going to get absolutely railed on their DNC cost going forward, on their operating cost going forward. Watch this. It's going to be a big divergence yet again in certain companies and how they deal with this and how much it affects them going forward. So keep an eye out. Look at the percentage change compare it to their peers, see which ones are getting affected more. Cash cost reduction, this is what I talked about. They're saving about $3 a BOE between 2021 and uh, 2022. And then it goes down further. You know, Take this into your model. We, we never put this in the model. We never accounted for them making an extra two to $3 a BOE going forward, right? So, there are minor adjustments to be made once you've figured out the company generates enough free cash flow. There are adjustments that should be made, uh, especially if you're taking a pretty significant position. You know, I look at all these things, I try and bring them back into the model one way or another. So, for example, this one, I calculated they would make an extra $75 million due to operating cost reductions. What I would do. In my other free cash flow sources, I would add that to my calculation and I get a better number as to what's going on. Um, okay, the next thing with New Vista is their debt. What's going on with the debt? Okay. In 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016, we saw a wave of bankruptcies. A lot of companies in the Canadian oil and gas sector went under. Why? Their debt was too high. Simple as that. They had way too much debt for the cash flow they were generating. Look at New Vista's debt profile. We have a $470 million credit facility. I think that's termed out to the next two, three, four years. That's only about 35% drawn, okay? So they're only about 35% drawn on their line of credit facility. And their senior debt is not due till 2026, okay? 
So why am I way more bullish on this cycle than I was in 2014? And, and trust me, I was bullish back then too, um, until shale came along and changed everything. But the reasoning is this time, I don't see any of these companies going bankrupt at this point. The bankruptcy, the bankruptcy risk is gone from these companies for the most part. There are still companies that are higher debt and if, if oil went to $70, they would be struggling. But for the, for the majority of the companies out there, they have two, three, four, five years until debt is due. They have lots of room on their line of credits. So I don't see the insolvency risk this time around, but it's still getting priced in, I believe, in some of these companies. So a lot of people that are not, are not closely following the sector still think that these companies are gonna go bankrupt if oil goes back to 70 or $80. Not the case. In my opinion, this is my opinion, Please do your own due diligence on this, on this exact statement. I don't think there's going to be bankruptcies this time around, even if oil fell to $70, $80 a barrel, which if you know me, you know I don't think that's going to happen, but if it did happen. Um, so when I talked about earlier that these companies are going to re-rate to a free cash flow times eight multiple, part of it is going to happen because people realize, hey, hang on a sec. These companies have really deleveraged. They're not as risky anymore from a bankruptcy insolvency perspective. So we're gonna give them more credit. We're gonna give them the benefit of the doubt here. And we're gonna re-rate them a little bit higher. When is that gonna happen? No idea. I, I can't tell you when it's gonna happen. It's, it might be in six months. It might be in three months. It might be today happening as we speak, right? But it's gonna happen, I think as times go on um, and, the, and the structural cycle becomes clearer, people are gonna get more confident in the industry to begin with. Um, okay, a couple more things on New Vista and then we'll get to Obsidian. So Western Canada condensate supply and demand. I've talked about this before. Condensate, which is what New Vista produces, as you see up here, we had the uh, condensate number, 21,000 barrels a day. Condensate is in a perpetual undersupply in Canada. We need it to blend with the heavy oil and the bitumen that we send down south. It has to be used. And we're currently importing condensate from the US. It's one of the only products or one of the only crude oils that we actually import from the US. And perpetual undersupply, it's gonna be a strong market going forward. That's what investor produces. You know, <laughs> I don't really need to say more on that. It's, it's pretty straightforward. And natural gas price diversification. Keep this in mind. In my intro to North American markets, I talked about the different pricing hubs for natural gas. They trade at different pricing. The Waha hub in Texas trades at a completely different price than Chicago, than ACO then Malin, Sumos, Washington State. They're all different hubs. They all get different pricing. Look what Duvista has done. Just as the LNG Canada starts ramping up as it gets closer in 2024, Duvista's exposure to ACO goes up 3x. It goes from 11% to 31%. They're looking into the future. This management team has said, look, LNG Canada is gonna be coming online in 2025. ACO pricing might rise because of this and they position themselves for it. Smart, smart thinking. Additionally, 10% of their gas is going to California. People who are following the California natural gas market know it trades at a huge premium to ACO, to Henry Hub, maybe it continues to trade at a higher and higher premium, right? So we can get deep into the details of these things, try to figure out how much extra are they getting on their gas? What's going on with the, uh, which basis are they selling their gas at? We can get deeper and deeper into these companies and spend more time on it. And we can find gems, diamonds in the rough that things that people are not focused on. 
I would say for every natural gas company, check it out. They all post this thing here. They all tell you where they're selling their gas. You can find companies that are set to benefit as the natural gas bull market goes on, that are set to benefit more than the others, may change your investment thesis on certain names. Just putting that out there, um, it's worth focusing on, it's worth spending time on. Uh, okay, so there's a couple questions here. So, uh, does the Nuvista hedging fall off in 2023? Yeah, so the Nuvista hedging is right here. Uh, if you want to have a look, uh, right here. So we see they have very little hedging into 2023, and any hedging they do do will be at much better pricing than a lot of the hedges we had in in, in 2021 and 2022. So it's kind of a win-win situation uh, going forward. I don't look past the first year. When I'm looking at free cash flow calculations, I only look at the next 12 months and bring that back to kind of what's going on because we don't want to look at 12 months more than that into the future. It's just too far out. We don't know what's going to happen that far out. And a lot of people don't invest more than a year out anyway. So it doesn't make sense to look at it regardless. Uh, okay, so yeah, but thanks for the question, great. Uh, okay, so what's your take on Paramount 15% stake in Nuvista? Um, so they did sell a bunch of shares of that chunk they had, I think two or three months ago, but I think it was strictly an investment purpose. Paramount is a neighbor to Nuvista in Wapiti and that car, Montney area, Wapiti, and what's the other name? Uh, Pipestone. Paramount is a neighbor. They probably realized, hey, New Vista, like let's sub $1 in 2020 makes no sense. Let's invest in them and make some money off it. So I think it's more of an investment than a takeover candidate, but you never know. Paramount might be waiting for New Vista to grow to that 90,000 BOEs. And then wham, they come in and make an offer and, and take over. Okay. So the next question is, are you considering adding New Vista? No, no, New Vista like, is a name I follow. I look at very closely, but I already have exposure to the Montney natural gas condensate players through Spartan Delta and through Crew Energy. And New Vista just doesn't fit in there right now. Uh, not saying it can't, but uh, right now, actively, I'm not looking at, at adding New Vista uh, to my portfolio. But yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so we're, we're already an hour and a half, hour and 10 minutes in here. So I'm going to try and go quick here. So that's that on New Vista. On the next one is Obsidian, which people know is a company I recently added to my portfolio. And it was just trading at a, at a multiple that I thought was just absolutely insane. And again, this is not investment advice. Please do your own due diligence, risk tolerance, and portfolio construction. Three things to watch for when you're looking and investing in, in oil companies. Um, so exact same methodology. I'm not gonna run through it for the sake of time, but I, I did the exact same calculations that I did for New Vista. You know, we, we looked at the, the production. Um, we looked at the breakdown of the production. We looked at the shares outstanding, share price, you know, hedging, blah, blah, blah. And we get the fair share prices. So I'll throw a little comment in there about why I added to Obsidian or why I started a position. Because at strip pricing, it's worth about $22 a share. So about 120% upside, roughly the same as New Vista, maybe a little bit higher. But the reason is because Obsidian gives me the upside torque. At $120 oil, it's worth about $40.72 a share. About a 4x from where we are today. Why is that? Financial leverage. New Vista's debt to EV, which I talked about earlier was 0.16. Obsidian is 0.35. A 
more heavily debted company, you're going to get more financial leverage. Simple as that. That's just the way it works. The more debt the company has, the more torquey it is, the more upside it has if prices go up, the more downside is it has if prices go down. Um, so just keep these things in mind. But at strip pricing, we have roughly 22% free cash flow yield. At 120 oil, which we were just at two weeks ago, it's about a 37% free cash flow yield. So um, very, very torquey company on the upside. We put the hedges in, we put the gas hedges in, we put, put in the production growth. This number is already outdated because Obsidian just put out an update that they're gonna aggressively expand in 2022, their capital program. So I'm gonna be adjusting this. Once Q2 results are out, I'm gonna adjust the whole model to fit that extra growth in there. And we'll, we'll, we'll see what comes out of it. Um, yeah, but basically hedging put in, we put the production growth back in and we get the fair share prices at the including hedging, including growth numbers. So again, strip pricing, 25.77 a share. At $120 oil, $6 gas, it's about $44.72 a share. So as the cycle progresses, I look at companies with higher torque on the upside. Obsidian happened to be one of them that, that had a really, really solid risk reward profile from my perspective, from my portfolio construction. Uh, so I put that in there. And again, if you want to look at 2023, you can go into that. I'm not going to talk about it much. I'm going to go straight to the insight section here and uh, just talk about these things here. And we'll, we'll try and wrap this up here by, by uh, 1.30 Mountain Time. So big production growth plans. Obsidian is definitely a growth company. Now they have 20 to 25% growth per year baked in. Look at the numbers, verify the numbers, see what they're saying. Um, you know, so at $120 oil and $7.50 gas, they're saying $262 million of free cash flow. Our model had roughly, two, 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 you know, four, 474 um, free cash flow before the expanded capital program. So when we take the impact of the new capital program in, the free cash flow should go down. However, Obsidian, I find, is consistently sandbagging their free cash flow numbers. It's always low. They always put out lower guidance than what the model puts out. And I found they beat their own guidance a lot of the time. Keep these things in mind. What the company tells you, they want to underpromise, over deliver. Every company in the oil field wants to do this. They don't want to promise big things and then not meet them because the market will absolutely destroy them for something like that. Instead, you'll find a lot of companies are consistently sandbagging, giving you lower production numbers, giving you lower free cash flow estimates than what a simple model uh, can, can tell you. And it varies significantly. So this is why I love running my own models instead of just trusting what management puts out, I can actually vet everything, see where my numbers are, are deviating from what they're saying. So yeah, it's a, it's a vote of confidence that if you're serious about oil and gas investments, you're putting a lot of money into it, it may make sense to just have a simple model. You don't have to use mine. You can set up your own Excel spreadsheet, your own, your own valuation, but Verify what they're telling you because a lot of them are so like PTSD that they want to under promise by such a large margin, it throws off the entire relative valuation within the sector if you only use their numbers. So just something to keep in mind as you go through these and, and look at these companies and uh, kind of what's going on there. So, um, okay. The next one, we want to look at well performance. For those that follow my Twitter, that's, that have followed the sessions, you know I like to look at 
who is the best operator, who is drilling the best wells. Right here, the purple line is obsidian. And why do I find this chart fascinating? Because if you look at the first three to six months, Obsidian actually doesn't have the best wells. It's Entrada, Inplay, Yangera, Bonterra. They have, they have better wells for the first three to six months. And then the Obsidian wells take over. This is an insight that, that, I, that I'm gonna say an interpretation as a petroleum engineer, as somebody who's worked in the field, Obsidian is producing their wells properly. They are not ramping them right off the start to show, oh, look, we have these massive IP numbers. We have these huge production right off the bat. They're instead, I think, choking the wells back. They're producing them properly. They're making sure they don't have sand issues, water channeling, water coning. And look, their outperformance over here after six months is way better than all these companies that, that wanted to show these sexy IP numbers that look, we have these huge initial production rates and then the wells just die and basically do nothing um, six months on. So I really, really like to see this when I look at companies that have poor IP90 and IP180 numbers, look at their wells and how they perform after the fact. Do they actually end up producing the most oil? In this case, yeah. And to put a technical spin on it, the area under the line, under the graph, between these two lines, like as time goes on, is way bigger than any benefit that these companies got right off the bat. And in fact, they might have screwed up the reservoir, they might have screwed up the geology, uh, got skin damage underneath, uh, downhole. Keep these things in mind. Look at which companies are up are operating their wells properly and are gonna benefit in the long run from lower decline rates, better capital efficiencies, better EURs, um, ultimate recoveries in these wells. Very, very important uh, because what's the game these days? The game these days is let's put out the best sounding IP30 number and the best sounding IP90 number but an oil well is not 90 days. An oil well is 20, 30, 40, 50 year process. So lo long-term gain for short-term pain is how Obsidian is tackling this. And I think it's a better way going forward and potentially why they can actually grow at these rates because their, their legacy decline rate is not as high as some of these companies that are overproducing and then underperforming on the wells. Uh, this is the Clearwater, yeah, Peace River Clearwater slash Clearwater wells that Obsidian put out. So, you know, th they're trying all kinds of things. This company has always been innovative. If you go back to the Penn West days, even, this company has always looked at the latest technologies, the latest state of the art drilling techniques, et cetera. They're drilling wells with 16 legs up to 26 kilometers of horizontal length downhole. So, you know, watch, watch these things, see how they do, see how they're doing, um, how these wells perform going forward. Watch for new technology. The clear water is one area, these, these multilaterals where there's still a lot of technological revolutions that can be made here. And which company is gonna do it? The company that's actively looking to do a bunch of work. So keep an eye out on this. They have a lot of property in this sort of area, the Peace River area with the multilateral potential. So this could be a huge play that, that nobody's really talking about. And here you go. Look at the amount of land they have next to Baytex, next to the Baytex P-Vine, which are the best wells in the Clearwater by far. Um, Obsidian's right next to them, adjacent. They're in the EV, uh, Nampa, and all these areas. All I'm trying to say is if, if these wells pan out, we saw what happened to Baytex and their kind of company, it transformed them, this Clearwater play. 
watch for Obsidian and how they do. Their wells are coming on pretty damn strong. Like 450 barrel a day wells are, are, are pretty good for having been online for, for three to four months, five months now. Uh, ARO, asset retirement obligations. The dirty word that people don't wanna hear about this. They, they don't want asset retirement obligations. They don't want liabilities. At $100 oil, this liability becomes an asset. A well that only makes money when oil is $80 and above is an abandonment candidate. When oil is $60, you abandon it. You put cement down and you abandon the well. At $100 oil, you can put a bunch of money in up front and start making money off this well. It's already drilled. It's already got casing. You're not worried about any supply chain issues. It's already, you don't need rigs. You don't need any sort of extra work. It's already there. You already built the lease. You already built the wellhead, the separator package, the flow lines, everything's built. So we want ARO. Not saying this is gonna fit your investment criteria or your portfolio construction, but ARO for conventional wells can become an asset if the prices, if the commodity prices are higher. This is my opinion. This is very counterintuitive. It's very different than what a lot of people would think, but it's important to at least think about it this way. Okay, I'm not saying you have to agree with me. Think about it this way. If you have old abandoned, abandonment candidate wells that don't make money, that are not capital efficient, the entire formula changes when commodity prices go higher. All you need is a small work over up front. You can get the well on production. You might even get flush production that comes off this where because the well has been shut in for a long time, it might actually end up producing more for the first few weeks or the first few months. Pay off that work over, the rest is pure profit at that point. So keep these things in mind. Obsidian is one that can really benefit from this. Um, potentially restarting wells that were on the abandonment list just six months ago. Uh, okay, so Robert has a great point here that Obsidian is putting their, their long lateral wells because it ensures that they get a flat 5% royalty for several years. Great, great point. And I know you've talked about this before, Rob. Uh, so appreciate you bringing this up again. And uh, there you go. The company is actively looking how they can make the best of this royalty scheme. So taking advantage of, of everything that's out there, that's what you like to see. Um, okay, so I thought they weren't focusing on the clear water, but the Viking, yeah, so Obsidian is drilling a bunch of wells in the Viking as well, but the Viking is, is such a small play for them. It's like 2% of their corporate production. Uh, you know, I think they're, they're thinking, look, let's let's get that Viking a little bit drilled up. They might even sell it. I, I don't know, but I don't think they're focused on the Viking. They're just capitalizing an asset that was basically dead for, for many, many years. It doesn't mean that they're buried from the clear water, I don't think. It just means that they want to diversify their between their three assets, the, the, the Peace River area, the Cardium, and the Viking. They want to diversify and put more money into each and grow them all out as opposed to just one. Um, so there's another question here about why do they abandon wells? So, okay. Let's say you have a well that goes down because there's, there's something wrong downhole. And, and this is a great question because it'll explain what I talk about with the ARO is, let's say there's a well that goes down and there's a pump problem, there's a downhole problem, you don't know, right? You get a quote from your engineer, from your field guys, they say, it's gonna cost about 50 grand to fix this well, get it back on production, okay? It's gonna make roughly, just throwing numbers out there. It's gonna make 10 barrels a day. That's what they tell you. Once you fix this, it's gonna make 10 barrels a day and you spend $50,000 up front. Okay, you say, okay. When oil, price are, when oil prices are $60, this well actually may not make money because 
your operating cost plus your cost to transport the oil and process the water, dispose the water, et cetera, et cetera, might be $50, $60 a barrel. So you're only making, let's say $10 a barrel profit if you fix the well up, okay? So 10 barrels a day, you're making 10 barrels or $10 a barrel profit, you're making $100 a day. You gotta spend 50 grand up front. The payback on this well is roughly a year and a half, right? 500 days it'll take to pay back and then it makes profit. That's assuming it doesn't decline and that's assuming nothing else goes wrong within that 500 days. Okay, now you say, ah, oh, let's just abandon this well. It's too much work. It's not, it's not cost efficient. Let's just abandon it, okay? Now, when oil prices are $100, this well has gone from making a, a $10 profit to a $50 profit per barrel. Multiply by 10, you're making $500 a day. Now your payback has gone from a year and a half to three months. Right? It's gone from 500 days to 100 days. And now you might say, look, we can't find drilling rigs. So let's just get a workover rig. We don't need casing. We don't need steel. We don't need pipelines. Everything's already built. The well is already there. Let's go back and reactivate it. That's the thinking. These are the discussions that I can guarantee you are going on within these oil companies is which wells on the abandonment list are now profitable. Let's go back and fix them. They go out from ARO, they actually become an asset. So not saying you have to think of it like this. I'm saying consider it because the, these are the discussions that are going on already. And it would be wrong for us not to think of things at least from that, that sort of perspective. Um, and this is more for conventional companies, not, not the oil sands and, and, and like, deep sour gas abandonments, those are never gonna be profitable. So these are more the small oil wells that pump between one to 10 barrels a day. Uh, they end up becoming quite profitable at this pricing. So yeah, thanks for that. And uh, Rob has some other information here on the, on the obsidian stuff that they are re-drilling wells instead of, instead of drilling new wells, they're re-drilling horizontal wells. So Again, I didn't even know this. And I, I just talked about how they're so technologically advanced. They look at the newest technologies. There's your example right there. Um, okay, so a couple other things on Obsidian. Keep an eye out for the liabilities, the share units, uh, deferred share units, performance units, the share-based compensation units. Keep an eye out for the liabilities. Why? When the share price was like a dollar, three dollars, nobody cared. Nobody looked at share price liability. It wasn't a big deal. It was like, ah, whatever. It's a few million dollars, less than 10, not a big deal. However, a lot of the units that, that employees and management got in the last two years were at very, very low pricing, naturally. The like Obsidian is, it, is up 10 to 15 X in the last two years, let's call it. So a lot of those units are more and more and more in the money. And because their warrants or their options, they have an inbuilt leverage factor to them. So what's happened is that in less than two years, the, the share-based liability has gone from $1 million to 40 million. And that's not because they put out more, more shares or give out more bonuses. It's because the literal value of those warrants and options has gone up that much, okay? We're now at $40 million of liability. This company is only worth about um, $1.3 billion. That's a pretty significant share-based liability that we're sitting on at only a $10 share price. If the share price goes to, let's say, $20, $25, this could be something that we need to watch is how much does this liability start adding up to and what's the dilutive effect of this on the actual share price? So not a big deal right now, something to watch. As share prices go higher, look at which companies gave out a 
metric ton of options and warrants when prices were lower. You'll find there's a few companies I'm actively talking negatively about their management teams. You'll find they've given out millions and millions of options at very low pricing. It's gonna have a very, not a huge detrimental impact, but something that's gonna impact the price going forward. Something to think about anyway. And um, yeah, something to focus on as, as the share prices go higher. And the final thing is the net asset value per share getting more and more important. I've talked about this and the, the methodology that I use, I look at free cash flow, which companies are generating cash flow. Then I look at net asset value. It's how I got into Obsidian. The free cash flow added up to what I wanted. And then the net asset value added up to what I wanted. There are two PE reserves at $85 WTI is about $24 a share. So not only do I have the free cash flow uh, valuation model looking, looking, looking really, really good where I have this upside, the net asset value model is also seems to be giving me a lot of upside. These are the sorts of companies I like to invest in where I have both metrics met and then I just sit there and I, I just watch, watch the commodity price play out and uh, hopefully make money as, <laughs> as the share price re-rates. But watch for net asset value more and more. I'm gonna be talking about it more and more because that's what the funds are looking at. That's what the banks are looking at. That's what the institutions are looking at. How much value do these people have in the ground? We need that security. It's almost like a collateral on the investment that they're making is that there, there's this oil under the ground to begin with. And the last thing, which also got mentioned here, but Obsidian has about $2.3 billion of tax pools. They have one of the highest tax pools out there along with Bonterra, Cardinal, Surge, some of these companies. Um, these companies are not, are not gonna be paying tax for three to five to seven years. It's a big benefit compared to some other companies that are gonna to have to pay that 20, 25, 30% tax going forward as early as 2023. So if you're a long-term investor, keep these things in mind, it is gonna affect the share price going forward. The tax pool situation makes about a 20, 25, 30% difference in your end free cash flow number that you end up at. So keep it in mind. Um, okay, so. G Money has a question. Why would a company spend more on ARO than they're, than they're required to? Don't have an answer for you. I, I don't think I would, I would be spending any dollar more because like I said, if I own suspended wells, I would just wait till the commodity prices are, are high enough that these wells become economic. Yeah, there's certain wells that are never gonna be economic and you abandon them, but a lot of things change at hundred dollar oil in terms of ARO that people are not even willing to talk about. They, they just wanna treat ARO as this like evil, nasty, dirty word without understanding what it is or, or discussion on it as to what it actually means, how it's calculated, what can be done to address it? How can we use it to our benefits? We need to be having these conversations, especially with the older legacy conventional producers. Okay. Aventiv, I'm gonna run through this right quick because you get the idea of what I'm talking about here. So production, shares, WTI, look at the hedging impact. They took a massive hedging loss in 2022 Q1. The fair share prices um, after we put the hedging in, okay? And before we put the hedging in. So hedging is a big, big issue with Oventiv, massive concern here. So just to compare numbers at strip pricing, the fair share price is $162. At 120 oil, it's 222. So 162 and 222. Now let's put hedging into the equation and production growth into the equation. Look at these staggering numbers. At $120 oil and strip gas, Oventiv is gonna lose two and a half 
billion dollars in hedging loss over the next 12 months. Absolutely atrocious financial hedging. Like this is pretty bad. What does it mean? If you know me again, you know I love front running these hedges dropping off. It's a little early for me to look at Aventive because they still have nine months of hedging going on on the gas side and on the oil side. But look how the numbers change. We had 162 and 222 as a fair share prices before we put hedging in. After we put hedging in, it went to 122 and 162. So we lost about 40 to $60 a share in hedging loss. Oventive trades between 40 to $60 a share today. So they can double their fair share price just by the hedges rolling off, which is December 31st, 2022. All these nasty gas hedges and absolutely piss poor oil hedges roll off. The company transforms. It literally transforms. So I'm seeing more and more people messaging me about Aventive because I think they're noticing this exact same thing that I'm looking at, that this company is so hampered by hedging. And if you believe natural gas pricing in 2023 is gonna go even higher as the European winter crisis lengthens, as the LNG terminals are back online, um, you know, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Consumption is going up within Canada, within the US, within Europe, within Asia, within Africa, Middle East. There's a case to be made for, for me, especially looking at Aventive just prior. So sometime between Q3 and Q4, and you wanna front run these hedges. There, it's, a, it's a investment thesis that's worked very good for me, for other companies um, where the hedges rolled off or are gonna roll off in five days in, on, on June 30th. I've done very well using this model. And I really wanted to talk about Aventive because people are talking about it. And I wanted to explain some of the share price underperformance is because of these hedges, unfortunately, that don't roll off for another six months or yeah, six months from today. So December 31st. So yeah, that's about it. So Aventive's 2022 capital program is about $2.2 billion. They're losing more in hedges than their entire capital program. That's how bad these hedges are. That's how bad the situation is. That's where opportunity lies. As a long-term investor, that's where opportunity lies. This is not investment advice. I'm just giving you the numbers and how things change as the hedges roll off. So top 15 wells in the Modney over the last, I think this is the last year, Aventive's got 14 of them. Their asset quality is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, in terms of gas production, they have wells that came on about a year ago that are still producing about 5,000, four to 5,000 BOEs a day of gas. Just visualize that. Like wells that came on a year ago are still producing 4,000 plus BOEs a day of gas. So, um, prolific acreage, prolific Montney acreage that they're gonna be growing out in preparation for LNG Canada. They have a lot of acreage in the US that's more gas focused. Um, they can expand, they can expand their production. They have the asset base to do it. So watching very, very closely. However, their condensate production has seems to be going down. So this graph, thanks to um, Taylor Merritt off Instagram or off Twitter, he put out this chart about a couple months ago that their condensate yields are actually going down. So they were producing 25 barrels and MCF of condensate about two years ago. They're down to 10, between 10 and 15. So what's happening is they are actively seems to be targeting more dry gas acreage and not focus on the condensate or their asset itself is just not producing the same amount of condensate. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? 
I have no opinion right now because the natural gas market has itself gotten very strong. If oil prices kept going higher and natural gas was weak, I would say this is a massive concern that you're not producing condensate, which is your liquids high net back barrel. But with natural gas pricing rocketing up too, this might actually end up being a benefit uh, going forward that they're not having to worry about liquids handling and selling. They just create gas and they sell gas at five, six, seven dollars, ten dollars at MCF to rake in the money. Okay, so let me get through these things and I'll talk about, or maybe let me do these questions first here. So when would be a good time to buy a Vintiv? Uh, depends on your thesis, I guess, but but if the commodity market stays strong, it's it's strong into the fall, into 2023. Uh, the, the answer to that question would be, you wanna buy it before everyone else does. That would be the only correct answer to, to this sort of question. And not investment advice, please don't take these things as me telling you what to do. It's not by any means. I just like sharing ideas. I like sharing investment opinions, thesis. You do with them what you will, but I can't tell you when would be a good time. Um, there's certain companies that I, I front ran the hedging dropping off by like six months, by 12 months sometimes, just because I, I wanted in right at the start. Um, there's no answer to this. So uh, the question asks, did they buy in Canada? Oventive is in Canada. They just changed their name. They domiciled in the US. And as much as we, you know, so, some people in Canada got very patriotic over it. I think fairly so. I think what Aventive did slash in Canada did was actually made sense that in the US, US based companies have a lot higher percentage of passive income investments than Canadian based companies. And they proved it. They actually show data that proves that. So uh, do, 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 if you believe in what they're doing, buy now. Yeah. Um, I can't comment on that, but yeah, G money makes a point here. So is the poor hedging a sign of bad management? Not, not really. Aventive actually had really good hedges in 2020. When, when the price collapsed, they had the best hedges out there, but they went overboard and they, they hedged all the production they had. They had unhedged, they hedged that, and they brought the prices down of all their hedges. And now they're stuck in them for 18 months, two years it's gonna roll off at the end of 2022. So I don't think it's bad management, but I think it's a management that panicked in 2020. They, for some reason, they had the best hedges and they, and they screwed that up by hedging more at lower pricing. Like it doesn't really make sense, but I think they, had, they also had done a big acquisition at the time, new field exploration, I wanna say. So they were just protecting the downside. Sometimes you give up upside when you protect the downside. It's just the way things roll. I'm not gonna blame management on this one. Uh, there, there's other companies I will. I will take, take it and blame management. In this case, maybe not. Um, more of a neutral situation. Uh, <laughs> wonder if it was Doug Suttles who did those hedges. Yeah. Uh, Robert, you're poking the bear here. You, I don't wanna be making comments about people, but... Uh, yeah, there, and can I used to have very, very poor management. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so this one, this is a very interesting slide that they had in their, in their slide deck. They produce about 10% yield, dividend yield. If they give out 50% of the free cash flow, a Vintive is roughly a 10% yield at today's pricing. Unhedged, it's an 18% yield. That's how much difference the hedges are making to their free cash flow potential. Keep it in mind. Again, I can't I keep talking about the hedges because really it's the only thing to talk about with this company. This thing is a monster, an absolute cash flow monster, but they screwed themselves up with these long-term hedges. What else do you say? A um, couple of things on the production to watch. Watch for cost inflation on the 
capital programs, you're already seeing this. It's only Q1 results and Q2 has, hasn't even ended. And you're already seeing up to 20% cost inflation. This is probably gonna get worse as the year continues. It's gonna to get to 30, 40%. Watch for it. Try and find a way to incorporate this into your models. I would say this is very important for the high decline unconventional players, your Monty players, your Duvernay players, your American companies. Better to be conservative on the capital than to get caught by a huge inflation cost further down the road, okay? The other thing, look at production and what's happening. Aventive is spending 20% extra on their capital, but they lower their production midpoint by 1%. Something doesn't really add up, does it? You're, you're spending more money and you're actually making less production. Find ways to reconcile these things. So this is because of the North Dakota outage that there was a huge winter storm in March, April, May, and it knocked down a bunch of production. There's a reasoning for it, but try and understand what's happening. Why are production numbers getting changed? Why is capital going higher? We shouldn't just take these things as gospel. We should try and understand them, explain them, and then try and understand, are their peers gonna be affected and their peers just haven't released the latest information? The best thing to do in oil and gas is to try and front run information, not illegal stuff, not insider trading. I'm talking about front running educated guesses you can make as to the state of the industry. And if Aventive is getting affected by inflation, one of the biggest companies, the smaller companies are gonna get affected. And some of them have not released any impact. They, they say, oh, we don't have any inflation. Don't worry about it. We're all good. And then you're going to get smacked in Q3 with a 40% inflation or a 30% inflation increase. We need to be prepared for these things and invest accordingly. Um, and when I say we, I mean anyone that wants to do this. I'm not saying I'm forcing you. This is your homework assignment. I'm saying if you want to be investing seriously in oil and gas investments, if you want to understand why companies are going to outperform going forward, it's important to look at some of these things and kind of what's going on. And I'm just sharing things that I look at and, and the way that I think about these things. You may think about them differently. You may think about it the same way. Um, the other thing was they're doing really good work on their completion speed, on their pumping efficiency, on their drilling speed. You know, they... There's guys on LinkedIn that talk about how they're doing such a great job with pace setters and all this. This is only good if the production results actually agree with them, right? I can drill a well in record time and the well is going to be all messed up because I didn't spend the right time to make sure I don't have dog legs in the well. I don't, I was actually in the zone that I wanted to be in, right? When you want accuracy and precision, you give up speed. It's just the way things work. You can't have both. So when companies are talking about huge increases in performance in the drilling and completions, you want to make sure the well results actually add up. And so far they do, but look at this. Q1 2022, Midland County in the Permian. We have Howard County. I think that's also in the Permian. The wells are not that great. These wells are not, are not pace setting like best production wells, right? So what's happened here? They, they're drilling faster. They're completing wells faster. They're completing wells cheaper, but the production in the Permian is not, is not that great. Like they're drilling longer laterals. They're not really getting good production. So could mean two things. One, the asset quality is degrading. The acreage quality itself is degrading. Or the second explanation for this is, yeah, they're drilling faster, but it's not, it, it's not helping them drill any better wells. Like they're not drilling top tier wells by any means. Like it's, it's almost mid tier to lower tier 
uh, if you look at these two graphs that they gave me, this, this is not even my research. If I research into some other areas, I might find areas where they're doing even worse potentially. So this point, I don't think I can stress enough times. From an engineering standpoint, it's completely different from a speed standpoint, right? You can, you can do whatever you want and drill faster, you can complete faster, but the wealth production has to match up. So far, it kind of is, but you're seeing declining gains in efficiency. You're actually seeing productivity loss in some of these areas. Something that I would question management on, if, I, if I'm meeting in investor relations or their VP of production or operations, I'd question them like, what's the explanation for this? How come your wells are not performing that great? What's, what's the reasoning for it? And try and understand before, if I was looking at Aventive more closely, that would be my number one question is, why are your wells not performing as good as they were you, you know, with all your increases in drilling? Are you, are you giving up production performance by trying to focus too much on drilling the fastest we can and completing the fastest we can? Are you losing production? Possibly they are. And uh, maybe something I will ask them when I do finally get a chance to um, connect with them. So two more things and then we'll end this. I talked about debt with New Vista. Look at debt of Oventive. It's due in 2030, 2031, 2034, all the way up to 2041. If you were a finance person looking at this, if you were running your own business and you were looking at this, are you concerned about debt payments in 2030? Not really, right? I'm, I have no doubt that this company is not gonna go insolvent. There is no way that any, you know, the oil price would have to collapse all the way until 2030 for, for this company to have any sort of bankruptcy risk, any sort of significant bankruptcy risk. Again, just my opinion, do your own due diligence on, on statements like this, right? You might have a different view on things, a different way you look at risk. For me and my, the way I look at risk, if, if a debt is due in 2030, I'm not really all that concerned about, about any sort of bankruptcy risk uh, going on here. And the last thing, royalties. People ignore royalties a lot, you know? They, they just say uh, royalties, whatever, you know, pricing, the higher pricing more than makes up for the royalty. Yeah, you're correct. However, let's just do some simple math here in the Montney. Last year, Oventive paid 7% royalty on a $57 um, realized price. Okay, that's roughly $4 a barrel of royalty that they paid last year. This year, it's 15% on $96 a barrel. It's about $14.5 a barrel royalty. The royalty has gone up, like the rate has only doubled, but the actual royalty per barrel contribution has gone up three and a half times. It's gone from $4 a barrel to 14 and a half, okay? $10 a barrel extra is just going to royalties. Run that number over 80,000 barrels of condensate production for a year, you will end up with some eye-popping numbers. So what's good for the Alberta government's coffers in terms of royalty, uh, incoming royalty stream, the, the money that they're getting can make a huge impact on the royalty payments that a lot of these companies are, are doing especially in the Montney, because the rate can go up to 40% of your, your, your realized price, okay? So now you're already kind of thinking, well, this is a big impact, okay? Now let me double the impact. What if Aventive had hedged their barrel at $57 a barrel, which is roughly where they're hedged, maybe a little bit higher than that, okay? So now, a year ago, they were getting $57 a barrel. They were paying $4 royalty. Today, they're still hedged at $57 a barrel, but they have to pay royalty on an unhedged barrel rate, which is $15 a barrel. 
you see how the how the math on hedged producers gets even worse and how it creates an even bigger opportunity going forward if if i'm paying $4 royalty and $57 it's roughly you know 7% as it says if i'm paying $15 on $57 it's more than 25% i'm paying a 27% royalty as that barrel goes from hedged to unhedged all that money is pure profit there is no secondary royalty impact right because you're already paying royalty on the unhedged price keep this in mind for heavily hedged montney producers there's names out there that I've talked about where this is having a huge impact. But as soon as those hedges roll off, pure profit. It's all pure profit. That, that change in pricing from hedge to unhedged, the operating cost doesn't go up. The royalty doesn't go up. The transportation cost doesn't go up. Nothing goes up except profit. So um yeah that's that that's today's uh presentation um always goes on longer than i wanted to but um there's there's some very important points i wanted to make that are non-financial related it's more insight and intangibles that maybe people don't really think about but i want to be having these sorts of discussions you know i want to have less discussions on why is oil price down why am I losing money? What's going on? What's the oil price going to be? You know, those sorts of discussions have no end to them. They, you're not going to, you're not going to get anything out of that because no one knows. But if somebody calls me and they want to talk about the change in royalty rate between Oventive versus Spartan Delta versus Arc Resources, I'm a nerd for those kinds of conversations. I will talk about things like that all day long. So please, if you're doing any sort of research analysis like this, please reach out to me. Um, you know, I'd be happy to share mine and and kind of go ideas back and forth and discuss things. And you know, for people that are already doing these things, having conversations, always appreciate you. Um, you you hit a nerve of my passion for oil and the deep diving nitty gritty stuff, um, which I just love discussing. So. Yeah, so there's one question here on the standard royalty rate. There, there's no real standard rate. It's very complex, very complicated. Um, you can get lots of royalty credits. You can get other development credits. The royalty rate changes based on the pricing and where you drilled, what kind of well you drilled, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a lot of reading. Unfortunately, G Money, the answer to to this question is it's a lot of reading it's very dynamic it's very variable and if you're interested i would say please um yeah have a look read read some stuff um learn a lot you'll you definitely learn a lot so and as alex says here the the royalty structures are different between each province so bc alberta different royalty schemes different credits different ways of amortizing those credits different ways of um tax burdens, you know, et cetera. So it really takes more, more than just a simple answer. And that's the oil industry in general. The, the, the oil industry is way more complex than people give it credit for. They think, oh, you just drill wells and you open up the pipes and the, the gasoline comes in the gas pump. Like, <laughs> yeah, that is how it works. But if you're an oil investor and you're you're serious about knowledge, you want to learn more, you want to know what you're investing in, you can spend three, five, ten years learning about all kinds of stuff and you know deep diving and whatnot. But um, I don't know, you know, people have their own interests and passions and different things they want to do in life, and they they only have so much free time. So um, yeah, I'll end it there. Thanks again for everyone that joined. Uh, really, really appreciate your time. I, I know some of us on Twitter, we've been trying to get the word out, share more about the industry. And I think it's been a long seven, eight, 10 years of talking to a wall. So I always appreciate everyone that joins in, asks questions, participates. We, from a white tundra standpoint, I'm gonna take next week off, uh, July 4th weekend, got some travel plans. And then we'll continue on 
this summer, I want to focus more on net asset value. And I want to focus more on the junior companies and share more about how I'm looking at these companies and kind of what are the positives, what are the negatives when they're flat out lying to you. And I can show you evidence of, of people lying to you on corporate presentations straight up um, and why, you know, it may make sense to spend time learning about the companies, learning about how they function, how they do things. The bigger companies are much better. They have much better governance structures, but, but um, we're moving to a cycle now where some of the smaller mid caps, junior companies are popping up and maybe people are looking to invest in them. So I wanna share more about that. And we'll, we'll continue to have our CEO sessions. We'll have our um, Twitter, Twitter talks and all that. So keep on keeping on. Um, thanks again. And hope everyone has a great rest of the weekend. And we'll see you after, after the July 4th. Uh, drive around, consume gasoline. So uh, go on road trips, spend money, uh, help out our gasoline demand numbers. And um, have a great long weekend. Everyone in Canada, uh, we'll catch you here just as Stampede is starting up. And um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see you at the next one. Cheers.